may be seated. Uh, let me pray. Uh, Father God, thank you, Lord, for obviously giving us the spirit to, to sing hallelujah this morning. Since you didn't take uh, us home this morning, we are here to give you honor and glory. We pray that your word that's going to be shared this morning uh, penetrates the hearts, the minds, and the souls of your children here this morning. We pray for your guidance, we pray for your direction, we pray for your peace. And again, we want to give you honor and glory in everything that we say and do. And it's in Jesus' precious name. And all God's children said, Amen. Speaking of children, it's time for you to go to class. Go to class. You guys have your own little church um, that you guys will be participating this morning. Um, I know you guys are pretty aware of it, but that is the next generation. Those are the pastors and teachers and missionaries that are going to be impacting the world. Bless those little hearts. Well, good morning, church family. Uh, it is good to be back with you guys again. Uh, we are going to be traveling through 1 John. Uh, chapter 5, we are going to be doing only five verses, um, but I do uh, want to point out that it is truly good to see you folks. Uh, there's also some folks that have been missing uh, and uh, shared with one of them this morning. Uh, they are missed, and so I am noticing when the church fam is gone, uh, you know, we're, we're praying for you. So I'm already feeling the connection, so I just want to continue to encourage you guys. If there is brothers and sisters in Christ that haven't uh, been um, in service for a while, hey, give them a call. You know, drive on over and say, hey, uh, do you have any sugar or, you know, could I borrow some eggs or something? Uh, but no, just, just check up on them and just continue to love on your brothers and sisters in Christ. So as you guys are already there in your Bibles. Uh, for those who don't know, we've been traveling through John's letters, and these letters have a repeated theme, and that theme is love. John also writes that if we believe in Jesus, we must be born again. And again, this love, mind you, that John is talking about isn't the emotional love isn't the uh, uh, sexual love. It isn't even the, the love that's driven by, um, oh, I love when so-and-so does that, or I love this place. This is a deeper, sacrificial love, agape love. So we are learning that John is teaching us to have that love in our fellowship with one another. And those who are also not of our family. Those who do not know God, we are to show love, which is very important, especially in the day and age that we live in. The world does not teach love. In fact, it's the opposite, especially when we bring the one uh, in conversation who gave his life for the world. And the moment you say, Jesus you're looked down upon. The moment a student would like to pray in the midst of a school setting, they are ridiculed. The moment that the court had the Ten Commandments and someone says, no, we need to take that down. That's not right. That's not love. But this is the world that we live in. And for uh, us as believers in Christ, we need to shout and hallelujah. We need to have that victorious perspective. And it's through His love that has changed you and me. And John continues to remind us that if we are called Christians who love God and yet hate our brothers and sisters and our neighbors, we are liars. God, Jesus, isn't in us he shares. So recapping from the previous chapters, 
we have learned that we know that we are a Christian by our attitude, our actions, and our affections. Our attitude towards hearing God, God's word isn't, oh, I understand this, but I don't care for that. Oh, uh, I like to be godly around these people, but not so godly around those folks. Actions, does it result to obedience in God's truth in our lives? Do others see Jesus in you? Or do they see a different version of you? Are you here physically, but mentally checked out? Is our affection of love for God the same as for our favorite football team? Golf, fishing, TV shows, crafts? Or is it a deeper love, that agape love? I hope and pray we as a fellowship are all on the same page with John. So let's jump right back into John's letter, starting in verse 1 of chapter 5. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Old man John, brother John, grandfather of the faith, is getting our attention by simply saying, if you and I love the Lord and we keep His commandments in loving others, that is a good place to be. And by living out this testimony, it is not burdensome. Church family, the best thing that we can do for ourselves is to love Christ. And the most purposeful and meaningful thing you can do for your spouses, for your children, for your family and friends, is to love Christ. Why? Because as you love Christ wholeheartedly, what are they going to see? If they hear you praying over that meal, what are they going to see? If the world around you is in worrying and have anxiety and you're full of joy, what are they going to see? If others see you reading God's Word throughout the week and not on a church day, what are they going to see? If they hear you listening to your Christian worship, what are they going to see? Jesus. The burden of religion is man's way to try to reach heaven. However, Jesus teaches us to have a relationship with him, which allows Christ through us to reach man here on earth. Do you guys understand that? The religion concept is to try to reach heaven. That's man and woman's way of thinking. And yet Jesus is saying, no, no. It's backwards. I want to use you to impact others here on earth. That's the appropriate way. That's the relationship of Jesus. And to be honest, that's how we all came to know Christ. Because someone said, hey, I care about you. How could I pray about your situation? How could I encourage you? Where is this coming from? Jesus changed my life. He's radically changed me. And now I want to share that with other people. I'm actually commissioned. You get paid? No, 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 I don't get paid. But it's a blessing to see Jesus change you. It's a blessing to see what Jesus can do in and around your life, just as he has done for me. Matthew 23, 3 and 4, you know, talks about how the religious rulers wanted to have people follow the legalistic views and sticking to man's way and not the Lord's. With so many laws and things uh, for you not to do, it became exhausting. 
We kind of talked about that several weeks ago, about the do's and the don'ts and the legalistic mindset that they had back then. And then Jesus arrives on this scene, guys, in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. It says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We should understand what the yoke is. We have a cowboy room theme. I'm not too sure who that belongs to here. But there's a yoke, actually too, there's actually a yoke hanging from the wall in the cowboy room. And what's really cool, again, that's a great visual for us. That yoke that goes upon the, the oxen back then would basically guide and steer that oxen to do his job. And it was a very difficult job. And so the world's vision here in the Old Testament of, of these prophecies and, and the, the prophets, they were not the prophets, the Pharisees were saying, you need to put this type of yoke on you. You need to live your life this way. And it became burdensome. Laws after laws after laws. And then Jesus arrives and says, no, I'm going to take that yoke off of you and put something else lighter. As a matter of fact, if you have burdens, lay those burdens inside. I will take those from you. What a great image that we get to see that Jesus is that type of person to love on you. Why wouldn't we want to surrender to the Lord? And it is because of that love Jesus lightens our burdens. Notice I didn't say that he will obviously take them away, but they're never going to happen. They are going to happen. We are going to have difficulties. And there is going to be times when we feel outweighed of our pressures of the world and our situations and circumstances. But Jesus does guide us through those difficulties. He gives us the scriptures that gives us rest that gives us peace, that gives us joy. His yoke is easier and the burden is lighter because we are not doing it on our own strength anymore. No longer struggling to do it man's way, but God's way. You're no longer putting self first, but putting Christ and others first. Here is a visual of what that looks like. Genesis 29, 16 through 20. Now, this is some old school scriptures here, okay? So, uh, we're going to take quite a few of you guys way back. Now, this is the story of uh, good old Jacob. And uh, he falls in love with Rachel. So, Genesis 29, 16 through 20. And it reads, Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he says, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your young daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Now, this arrangement takes place. And so Jacob thinks, hey, I'm going to do this because I'll love, I love her. I'll die for her. I'll do whatever it takes. Seven years, no problem. Laden at the honeymoon, he switches his daughter with Leah. And then Jacob, unfortunately, is like, wait a minute, that wasn't our arrangement, that was an agreement. And the father-in-law, you know, says, well, I can't, you know, give you the younger when there's an older, so the older has to be married first. But, since we're negotiating here, we can, I'll give you the younger daughter if you work 
seven more years. As messed up as it sounds, it still displays that Jacob would do anything for his love. Verse 27 reads, Fulfill her week, and we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve with me still another seven years. Another seven years. You think that would have stopped Jacob? Absolutely not. Because again, it seemed like a few days. Because he was focused not on himself, but the focus was on the one he loved. Jesus wants us to have that same type of commitment that Jacob had. Not out of obligation, not forcefully, but because you want to. Because you love wholeheartedly. Perfecting love produces joyful obedience. Now you remember the story uh, that I shared a couple weeks ago about uh, the young uh, groom who wanted to check the vows from the pastor and he read the vows and he wanted to make sure that uh, his wife would be obedient to him in the vows and he read it and said nope this is not going to work we need to we need to get that those words written in there i want my wife to say that she is going to be obedient to me and her fiance at the time took his hand and said honey we don't need it to be written in paper that i will be obedient to you is written on my heart. I love you. So for the rest of our lives in our marriage, I will be obedient. That's what love does. She didn't need to say it because she was going to live it out in their marriage. Love, again, is not out of obligation because that is what love does. It says... Me who? Not me. It's about you. It's about others. And that's what Christ did. He could have easily came down to earth and said, serve me. Instead, he says, I came to serve others. Verse 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. If you do not have that underlined or highlighted or circled, I would be doing that. And it says, our faith. Our faith. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory our faith. Does it imply our faith in education, our health, our abilities, our accomplishments? No. It implies our faith in Jesus. Our display of obedience to make us overcomers. Here we see the repeated word. And again, church, if it's repeated, it's to get our attention the good old classic saying hello McFly hello McFly this is what John is sharing he's getting our attention are we listening John understood this because at a young age he missed so many opportunities and now in his seasoned years he is explaining it to us Because when the pressures of life, the world begins to weigh us down, we tend to lose focus. And so as the last living disciple, he tells us with such urgency. Again, the grandfather of faith. Pay attention, church. Those who will be reading this, it's all inspired by the Holy Spirit. And John, he says, I know this is going to be impactful in the time of need for those who will be coming across these scriptures. Verse 5, Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Who is he that he there is Satan? 
Now, he might rule the world as the prince of darkness, but while we're here on earth, we are to be men and women who are to be the light, beacons of Jesus' love towards others. Here on earth, it is going to be the closest thing to heaven for unbelieving family members and friends that they will experience. And for us believers, this is the closest thing to hell we are going to experience. A hundred years old John is still sharing the message. And on April 11, 2021, whatever young age you are, we are commissioned to share Jesus. Now, bear with me as, again, you, you know uh, I love visuals. So in this scripture that we have right now, the camera is going to shift scene and we're going to go back in the past to a younger John. So turn with me to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. So we get the camera from Grandpa John now getting back to his younger days. <clears throat> John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither. This man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Jumping again over to verse 8, we're going to keep on reading. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. And he said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? And he answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Church, we are those who gather that have been touched by Jesus, who have been healed those whom Jesus has saved, those who Jesus uses. The outside looking in, they see people going to church. But you, 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 you are the church. We gather together in a building to worship, to fellowship, to seek prayer, to grow in His Word. So when it's over, the church, you, go right back out to that mission field. And you, the church, share the love of Christ. You leave here more equipped, more encouraged, strengthened. So you can return back to those mission fields. Look back at verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. And if Jesus is abiding in you, you are the light of the world. Verse 8, my favorite right here. And it says, Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind says, Is not this he who sat and begged? Is not this who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But the beggar said, I am he. In other words, Hey, honey, isn't that you know who? 
The one that always looking to fight someone? Isn't that the one who's kind of loud? Well, they're still kind of loud, but I don't know. It looks like him. Isn't she the one that... Aren't they the ones? Yeah. It looks like them, but they're still kind of the same, but there's something different. They're not cussing. They're not drinking. They're not depressed. No, it can't be them. It's the same person, though. Are you sure? I don't know. Your response? Hey, hon, I'm still the same person. Hey, friend, I'm still the same person. Hey, neighbor, I'm still the same person. But I've been redeemed. I have been born again. I no longer follow self, and now I follow Christ. I was lost. I was blind. I was numb. I was hurt. I was in darkness, but then Jesus came into my life. I shared on Wednesday that Jesus had the ability to walk on water, had the power to calm storms, control all living things, so he didn't need that stone rolled away last Sunday for him to be let out of the tomb. The reason for that stone to be rolled away and for that tomb to be empty, it was for more proof for our faith to know that Jesus is alive. And today, Calvary Chapel Mountain Center, we have a wonderful opportunity to share what Jesus is doing in and around your lives. Jesus has shown us time after time that he uses the beggar who then in return gives joy away. He uses the hurting who then gives comfort to the others. He also uses the prodigal to celebrate the Father. Now let's get back to John's first John. Old man John, chapter 5, first John, chapter 5. Verses 4 and 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. If you believe in Jesus, you are overcomers. And we are victorious. There is a story that a soldier in the army of Alexander the Great was not performing bravely in battle that he was not willing to press forward and was lingering behind. The great general approached his soldier and wanted to be of an encouragement and show sympathy and maybe reassigning to a different part of the battle. And so the general found the young man and asked, Young man, what is your name? The soldier replied, Alexander. The general looked him straight in the eye firmly he says, soldier, get in there and fight or change your name. Church, the world's view is to fight for victory. But we who are not of this world, we fight from victory. Because we know that the victory was won at Calvary. We are victorious. We are overcomers. The Lord never said, I'll show you, then you'll believe. He said, believe, and I'll show you. As Christians, we have many names. Beloved, believers, sheep, children of God, saints, soldiers, witnesses, brothers and sisters in Christ. This morning, we walk away knowing that we are also overcomers. This is the victory of our faith. Faith in what? Jesus. The Son of God. The person who overcomes the world is the one who believes in the one who overcame the world. That is me. That is you. That is this 
church. Alexander the Great might have wanted his name to be a symbol of courage. But let us leave here knowing our name in Christ provides the assurance of victory. In the midst of our day and age, you guys, we need more soldiers for Christ. We need to display the boldness of the Lord. And we need to do that in love. We need to share this message to a dying world. But they don't want to hear it. Again, they don't want to hear it in schools. They don't want to hear it in the workplace. They don't even want to hear it when they, uh, when they sneeze. God bless you. Really? But this is a time that was meant for you and for me. Is it possible to have my elders come up? If your wives are here, can you please come up? Please. I can have some elders and their spouses on my left and my elders to my right. I didn't give them a warning. So they're surprised. These are your church elders. Two of them. There's other missing. And their precious wives. These are the seasoned Christians who know your struggles, but who have counted the cost and seen many battles. But the purpose for this is to show you that they are here to fight alongside you in prayer. In closing, church, if there is anyone here who, despite this message, feels like a beggar, who is clouded by the world, who has lost hope, or maybe have walked away from your faith, or maybe you know that you have the religious part down, but you don't know the relation part of Jesus. Or maybe you feel defeated. Do not leave this place without seeking prayer from this couple. As I normally do, I will pray. And you guys are dismissed after we pray. You guys can hang out in the hospitality room. We have donuts, we have cookies, we have sweets for you and the kids. And then you guys can have fellowship outside. The reason why I want to kind of encourage people to leave is for those who want prayer to not be distracted by our conversations. And this is just happening because this is where we're at in the scriptures and the Lord pressed it upon my heart because I know that you are fighting a battle and we need prayer. And these are the ones who are going to do it side by side with you. This is how we roll here at Calvary Chapel Mountain Center. We are family. And when one struggles, we all struggle. When one hurts, we all hurt. How are we going to apply the victory in Christ if we're not seeking our brothers and sisters, if we're not really truly applying these words as overcomers? You're not alone. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your scriptures. I thank you for your powerful word. I thank you for the constant reminder. And I pray for those who are here. Lord, may you continue to give them the guidance, the strength, and the perseverance to press forward as they have uh, added to their name overcomers. And it's through Christ Jesus that will overcome all situations that will guide them through thick and thin. Our job is to share that same gospel with everyone that you put in our path. We thank you again for this message. May it be impactful, mind, body, and soul. It's in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you guys. I will see you guys outside.